Sometimes, the greatest horror is feeling like you're utterly alone in this world. And to be both hated by humanity for being completely different and shunned by those who could be like you is the source of both horror and tragedy in director James Whale's Bride of Frankenstein. Released in 1935, Bride of Frankenstein is far less about its cone-haired titular female creature and far more a meditation on the existential ruination of its signature bolt-necked monster played by Boris Karloff. Roaming the countryside after nearly being killed by a horde of angry villagers, the monster seeks connection and acceptance in a world that outright rejects him based on his very existence. All the while, he grows in intelligence and understanding, magnifying the weight of the continual rejections he faces around every corner that he could have shrugged off if he remained an unthinking beast. Bride of Frankenstein Directed by James Whale and written by William Hurlbut and several others, and oh so loosely based on Mary Shelley's classic novel Frankenstein, is a contemplation on the relationship between the profane and the beautiful, the spiritual and the blasphemous, and how their perceived differences can lead to the most tragic of circumstances in a world where mankind outright rejects anything unlike themselves. And although Whale had been reluctant to follow up his original film, this pivot to tragedy and away from straight horror turned Bride into the superior film, and one that remains beautiful and resonant today. To a new world of gods and monsters. While the narrative takes place right after the 1930 Frankenstein left off, all you need to know going into Bride is that Dr. Victor Frankenstein created a creature by reanimating life, and it really didn't go well. At the start of Bride, the monster survives an angry mob burning a windmill down upon him while an injured Dr. Frankenstein is taken back to his home, where his new wife awaits him. But the supposed peace is not held for long, as the monster once again roams the countryside, looking for acceptance and finding only fear and hate. Meanwhile, Dr. Frankenstein is approached by the obsessed Dr. Pretorius a former colleague who also wants to reanimate life, but needs Frankenstein's help to do so. I had ventured to hope that you and I together, no longer as master and pupil, but as fellow scientists, might probe the mysteries of life and death. These two dueling storylines of a creature brought back from the dead only to suffer through living, and of a doctor whose inescapable obsession with playing God leads to further destruction, detail the tragedy of human hatred against what is seen as queer. For what could have been the beauty of new life in the creation of the monster is marred by the limitations of man, and the toll of hatred and fear propagated by humanity. However, Whale and Hurlbut don't condemn the monster for being who he is, and the creature by and large is far more sympathetic than in the previous film. When we combine the monster's search for a friend who, like him, doesn't conform to societal norms, the coded nature of two men, Pretorius and Frankenstein, creating new life together, and Whale's status as one of the few out gay men in Hollywood at the time, we can see how Bride of Frankenstein can be given deeper meaning when read through queer film theory. Queer theory is a form of critical theory that is focused on analyzing the many mismatches between gender, sex, and desire present in our art, even beyond what may have been intended by the creator. In queer theory, we analyze and contest the ways in which society categorizes sexuality and gender, moving away from a heteronormative approach and seeing sexual and gender identities as fluid and individualized. And this approach can be applied to other categories beyond sex and gender outside the perceived norm. As discussed by David Halperin in Saint Foucault, Towards a Gay Hagiography, queer is, by definition, whatever is at odds with the normal, the legitimate, the dominant. There is nothing in particular to which it necessarily refers. It is an identity without an essence. Queer, then, demarcates not a positivity, but a positionality vis-a-vis -vis the normative. In any case, when we take queer theory and use it to analyze a work of art, no matter how old or new it may be, we can crack open long-standing categorizations that force us to see society from the perspective of dominant institutions, rather than those that do not conform to the so-called norm. Through this approach, we can see that LGBTQ lifestyles have long existed and influenced us whether or not society admitted to such a concept. And in Bride of Frankenstein, with its focus on birth and matehood, we can see in the monster, Dr. Frankenstein, Dr. Pretorius, the hermit, and the bride, a rejection of gender and sexual categorization, lacking fixed identities in their sexuality, and each being distinctly at odds with the norms of society. 
Although film historians and those who know Whale denied that the filmmaker sought to create direct metaphors with his film, Bride nonetheless has enough potent imagery and subtext to remain LGBTQ relevant in its meaning, especially as seen through the lens of The Death of the Author, a critical approach born from theorist Roland Barthes' 1967 essay, Le Mort de la Tour. In this rejection of traditional criticism's practice of sticking close to authorial intent when interpreting art, the death of the author argues that creator and creation are unrelated, and that the essential meaning of a work depends on the impressions of the viewer. In doing so, every piece of art is eternally written here and now. When Bride of Frankenstein is seen as an LGBTQ-friendly metaphor that aligns with Whale's own personal life, the film's sympathies are shown to most definitely lie with the monster. And although his existence as a creature reborn through unnatural, perhaps profane means, causes him to be hunted down by society, Bride of Frankenstein does not condemn Karloff's character due to his existence. While there are many other ways to view Whale's work, the most pertinent message is regarding society's hatred of those it fears, which is broadly applicable and criticized by Bride. But for being a film with such a heavy metaphor slung around its neck, Bride of Frankenstein is stranger, funnier, and deeper than its predecessor and most of its contemporary monster films. Those elements turn the film into something far more potent and timeless than what may be expected of a film from its era, even given the fondness deservedly shown for the classic Universal Studios monster films. As the monster travels through both towns and wilderness in search of peace, Karloff's creature takes on a journey with more than a passing resemblance to Christ. From being attacked and scorned by villagers to partaking in a Last Supper-like meal, This is bread. Bread. Mm. To being tied up and hoisted high on a pole that is most certainly a riff on the crucifixion, the monster is beset by a fearful and hateful humanity that rejects his status as a living being. But the monster is not a savior. Far from it. He's a creation of man, not the son of God. Being scientifically raised from the dead means that the monster is the embodiment of sacrilege within the confines of organized religion, and Christ's journey from life to death to life again is reversed. Now a journey from death to life to death in the monster. As such, his Christ-like tribulations reinforce his own blasphemous nature while still eliciting sympathy. The monster is not an antichrist, he's an inverse Christ. But despite his status as an undead, unnatural, possibly even blasphemous being, Bride continually shows that the monster is worthy of love and does not deserve the hate being thrown at him from all sides, breaking him out of the need to be categorized within an organized religion and simply valued as life. Once again, the queer reading of Bride of Frankenstein shows us that societal norms, such as a Christian definition of blasphemy or a belief in heteronormativity, should be rejected in favor of extending love and understanding to what some may see as the other. <laughs> The amount of violence and death wrought by the monster makes him a terrifying creature at first, but his continued suffering and growing humanity quickly turn him into a sympathetic, even pitiable, doomed protagonist. Even so, his unnatural origins are destined to have disastrous consequences on all who are touched by him. It's a fine line that is walked admirably well throughout Bride of Frankenstein, and one that is absolutely necessary in order to powerfully assert the message at hand. Alongside the tortured storyline of the monster is that of the Doctor, as Frankenstein is seduced by the chance to once again create life. Transitioning from reluctant participant to obsessed creator to repentant husband, Frankenstein's arc is ultimately about the rejection of foolishly playing God and accepting a better life, one where he can be with his new wife and perhaps ultimately create life through more natural means. And this is where the queer reading of Bride becomes a bit muddled. The film shows the result of two men creating life together as ultimately being wrong, while still valuing the otherness of the monster. The campy Pretorius makes life on his own as he doesn't have a means for natural birth. Our mad dream is only half realized. Alone you have created a man. Now together we will create his mate. And Frankenstein's eventual rejection of his latently homosexual partnership with Pretorius and reaffirmation of his marriage to Elizabeth is supported by the monster. Yes, go, you live. It makes the film messier in its ultimate values and allows for many interpretations. But this is why we study and discuss film, not to give black and white irrefutable definitions to the meaning of art, but to uncover the many layers of the entertainment we consume to make us think more about what we watch and enhance our own lives through analysis and debate. Is Bride of Frankenstein a perfect film? 
Absolutely not. But imperfections and the ability to interpret in multiple ways are what make art interesting. No film is perfect, no matter how many YouTube video essays say such a thing. And to give the definitive meaning, the so-called correct explanation of every film's ending or mystery strips true meaning from art, which will always be subjective. And a lot of film is perfect is not just dumb, it's boring. And probably why the video essay niche of criticism gets a bad rap. Perfection is enticing and clickable, but the adulation of something that doesn't warrant the label lacks real value. Enough with the criticism of criticism tangent. Let's keep digging deeper into Bride of Frankenstein. Wales film repeatedly shows us that what was done by Frankenstein is something that simple, uncaring humanity could never accept. Through his interactions with a saintly blind hermit who befriends him, in a scene famously parodied by Mel Brooks' young Frankenstein, and even in saving a woman who falls into a river, we see that the monster is not inherently violent or destructive, but driven towards such actions through the hate and violence of humans. And it is in the hermit's home where Karloff's character first understands the simple pleasures of connecting with another person. Eating, drinking, laughing, smoking, the monster and the hermit are bonded in a scene of domestic tranquility, where the creature is taught to speak. Alone, bad, friend, good. It culminates in a scene of love and peace, with the hermit thanking God for his new friend under a glowing crucifix showcasing that religious beliefs do not necessarily condemn the monster, so long as the believer does not immediately judge him for merely existing. Unfortunately, the traditional, organized religion of most villagers is hateful, inadvertently turning the monster into a satire of the core tenets of their faith through their own inability to be Christ-like. In the hermit's home, Concepts of friendship are finally understood by the monster, only to be quickly ripped away, here in the arrival of armed soldiers, making his now self-aware life all the more tragic. After fleeing, the monster meets Pretorius, who asks the newly vocal creature if he understands his origins. He shows that he does. Yes, I know. Made me from dead. I love dead, hate living. For a creature that has experienced both life and death, pining for death once again is a sobering note. But Pretorius is inclined to agree. You're wise in your generation. Of course, no discussion of Bride of Frankenstein would be complete without discussing the bride herself. The Bride of Frankenstein. While the creature only appears in the final 10 minutes of the film, her meaning can be felt throughout. The idea of a female creature is ultimately what brings Frankenstein back to his old ways, creating a type of bride from his own power while already having a loving bride that has chosen him. And it is the idea of a bride, the ultimate embodiment of a friend, that gives the monster himself some hope of peace and acceptance from another living being. Woman, friend for you. Woman. Friend, yes, I want friend, like me. After all, the monster also believed himself to have found a friend in the blind hermit before it was ripped away by those who found their union in need of destruction. The same romantically ambiguous but life-affirming term of friend is used by the monster for both the bride and the hermit, connecting these two societal outcasts as mates for the monster. Woman. Friend. Why? It's actually quite modern in its sexual connotations, rejecting the staunch definitions of heterosexuality and homosexuality in favor of relationships that are meaningful simply because they contain two people that love one another, freed from societal guidelines. It's coming up! In the creation of the bride, we once again see the allure and horror of creating life in one's own image. The bride is mesmerizing and strangely terrifying, a new creature that cannot grasp its own existence yet. However, upon seeing the monster, who approaches her with a heartbreaking tenderness and warmth, the bride lets out a primordial scream of terror. <coughs> rejecting the monster, who thought her to be the one creature on earth that could love and understand him. And in the bride's repeated rejections, the monster fully and completely rejects life itself. She hates me. 
like others. Allowing Frankenstein and his true bride to escape the castle where the new creature was brought to life. Yes, go, you live. The monster declares to Pretorius and the bride, You stay, we belong dead. Pulling a lever that overloads every machine as a tear rolls down his cheek, the monster destroys himself and the other two in a massive suicidal explosion. Do they truly belong dead? That is up to the viewer to decide. But the monster's proclamation is certainly the product of society's cruel, uncaring rejections. The monster's tragic resolution to re-embrace death after the unendurable measure of rejection he faced in life means Bride of Frankenstein is something more than just a classic horror film. It is a haunting, existential rumination on the nature of life and death in a cruel world, and one that has continued application in a modern society that questions its morals and sexual definitions more than ever. <laughs>